Welcome back to Math 104. Where have you already seen the expression we just obtained in the numerator of this fraction? We've seen this actually in each of the last two videos. It came up when we were computing the expected value of this die rolling game by the first method for computing expected value as the mean of an ideal data set. Written out the long way, that's the sum of all the values in that ideal data set, with the four copies of $2 and the three copies of $4 and the three copies of $6 and the two copies of $8, all divided by 12. But when we gather up like terms, when we gather up the four copies of two and write it as $2 times four, and the three copies of $4 and write them as $4 times three, etc., we realize that this expression is the same thing as $2 times 4 twelfths plus $4 times 3 twelfths plus $6 times 3 twelfths plus $8 times 2 twelfths. It is very important that you understand the algebra behind the equivalence of these two expressions. The whole point of this is that the computation that averages up an ideal data set of values is equivalent algebraically to this other computation using the second definition we gave last time of expected value. So we have two ways to compute expected value. One as the mean of an ideal data set of values, and the other as a weighted average of values. This was the second definition, value times probability plus value times probability. Relentlessly multiply value times probability and add them all up. You should be able to compute expected value by both methods. Why is it good to have two different methods? One reason is that students often find it easier to wrap their minds around the mean of an ideal data set. The idea of averaging a set of numbers where those numbers already know about the long-term behavior of the experiment. This other definition is the more traditional mathematical definition, and depending on how a particular problem is worded, how it's presented, one of these might be easier to use than the other. Must the associated values in the expected value computations be dollar amounts, as they have been in most of our work so far? No. The setup for expected value computations requires that every outcome have a numerical value of some kind associated with it and a probability. Here's an example. Suppose that, based on past experience, the organizers of an outdoor concert predict that 50,000 people will attend if there is sunshine, 40,000 will attend if the weather is cloudy, and 20,000 will attend if it rains. The weather forecast indicates a 50% chance of sun, a 30% chance of clouds, and a 20% chance of rain. The question is, how many attendees are expected at the concert on average, based on this information. Compute this in two ways. The first and most important thing to realize about this problem is that it is a job for expected value. It is an expected value problem. So let's think, what are the outcomes, what are the associated values, and what are the probabilities? So the outcomes are sunny weather, cloudy weather, or rainy weather. Sun, clouds, or rain. That is the sample space. Those are all the possible things that could occur. What are the associated values? Well, the associated values are 50,000 people, 40,000 people, or 20,000 people. I'm writing K for thousand. To each outcome, there is associated a certain numerical value. It's also true that we know the probability for each outcome, 0.5 for sun, 0.3 for clouds, and 0.2 for rain. Let's go ahead and compute the expected value, that is, the expected number of attendees at the concert, by our two methods. Method number one is find the mean of an ideal data set of values, where the values are the 50,000s and the 40,000s and the 20,000s. To understand what an ideal data set is going to look like, we need to think about the probabilities. What set of these values with a certain number of copies of 50,000, a certain number of copies of 40,000, and a certain number of copies of 20,000 will be perfectly representative of what happens in the long run if we were to repeat this experiment many, many times. We could just take 50 sunny days, 30 cloudy days, and 20 rainy days. We can make life simpler by just working with 5 sunny days, 
three cloudy days, and two rainy days. That means 50,000 five times. So five occurrences out of 10 with 50,000 people in attendance, three occurrences with 40,000 people in attendance, and two occurrences with 20,000 people in attendance. If you repeated this scenario 10 times, and those 10 repetitions of this scenario were perfectly representative of what would happen in the long term if you had billions of repetitions, then this is what it would look like. Our expected number of participants is then the average of these 10 numbers. The average, or the mean, equals 50,000 taken five times plus 40,000 taken three times plus 20,000 taken twice, all divided by the number of values that we're averaging over. That turns out to be 41,000 people. So on an average run of this experiment, 41,000 people will show up to the concert. Again, as in all our previous examples, this average value is not itself one of the possible values that could happen in one run of the experiment, but that's okay. It doesn't need to be. A way to say this is that the expected number of people attending the concert is 41,000. It's important that we also know how to use method number two, which, to be frank, is actually easier given the way that the information was presented in this problem. Method number two tells us to compute a certain sum. The sum of what? The sum of value, 50,000, times the probability of obtaining that value. So there's a 0.5 probability, a 50% chance, of 50,000 people attending. So we compute 50,000 times that probability, plus... 40,000, that value times the probability that it occurs. So 40,000 times 0.3 plus 20,000 times the probability that there are 20,000 people in attendance. So 20,000 times 0.2. You compute all of that, and lo and behold, you find once again that 41,000 people are expected to attend the concert. It is worth it to know how to do this both ways. Books and courses on this subject usually present expected value only the second way. Students might become proficient at doing the computations, but they often lack a conceptual understanding of what expected value really means. This is where the first approach, using ideal data sets, is much more concrete and sheds more light on why this computation is really telling us the long-term average of something. Here is another piece of terminology. An experiment whose expected value equals zero is called a fair game. Here's an example. A game is played in which you roll an unfair six-sided die with the following probabilities. 35% chance of a one, 20% chance of a two, 15% chance of a three, etc. All that information is given, and you are told, further, that when you roll the die, you will receive ten times that number of dollars. So if you roll a 1, you'll get $10. If you roll a 6, you'll get $60, etc. Assume for the moment that it doesn't cost anything each time you play. We're only going to focus on receiving money here. Before going on to the next video, answer the following questions. Compute the expected payoff of this game. Do this in two ways. And what should it cost you each time you play in order for the game to be a fair game in this technical sense?